Chameleon Academy. This is Bill Strand, and I am here with Jurgen Van Overbeek. Hello, Jurgen. Hello, Bill. How are you? <laughs> Doing very well, especially since today we are going to be talking about a favorite chameleon of mine, Triosaurus Johnsoni, or the Johnston's chameleon. So, uh, Jurgen, you want to? Uh, oh, actually, what I should do is uh, say hello to everybody. Uh, this is a live session, and what we're going to do is have a presentation, uh, and I'm going to be going over the uh, Johnson's Chameleon Care Sheet, and Jurgen is going to help by fleshing out uh, what uh, everything that goes around those simple numbers that are on a care sheet. And afterwards, we're going to have a question and answer session. And so uh, keep your questions for afterwards, although we may pick some from the middle, uh, just know that we're going to be we're going to be going pretty fast here, and so uh, we may miss your comments in the chat. But we'll see what we can do. Uh, hello, Karn. Yeah, Karn is here. Uh, all right. So let us go uh, uh, to. I want to introduce. We're going to start off by introducing the uh, new format for the Chameleon Academy Care Summaries. And so uh, I am going every I'm going to be doing this for every species that I cover in the Chameleon Academy. And of course, <laughs> there's a lot of work that goes into each one of these care summaries. And so it'll be a step by step process. We're starting with the Johnson's Chameleon because we uh, have this opportunity with Jurgen. And then we're going to I'm going to be going to next week. We're going to be doing first of Campani because I will be talking with Michael Nash. And so uh, we, we have a lot of species to go through here. Uh, but let's go ahead and uh, oh, oh, by the way. And so I, I'm going to be going through each page of these. So you don't have to worry about uh, looking at the fine print here. But let's go ahead and just uh, overall. Jurgen, let's talk about the Johnson's Chameleon, and maybe we can go ahead and uh, I'll pull up. Actually, no, no, no. Give me a second here. <laughs> let's go ahead and start uh, uh, just from an overall uh, a high level. Uh, uh, you know what? We should go to the other slide because there's more to uh, see there. But one thing I wanted to say about uh, what you're about to see with all of these pictures that I'm going to show you is that Johnson's chameleon is just like any other chameleon. And mm -hmm. we tend to like to show you the best and the brightest uh, when they're at the their height of their mating season or they're, uh, they're uh, trying to battle with another male. And so uh, it looks like a, a bag of Skittles and a pack of Starburst got in and into a fight. And so you have these wonderful colors. But chameleons aren't always that way. And panther chameleon owners, you know this. You see all the pictures of the breeders. They're just nice and bright. But when you get them, well, they're not always that bright. So I, I, I hope I want to let you know that throughout this presentation, you're going to see pictures of them in their brightest. But also you're going to see pictures of them at their normal state. And so uh, just know that just as chameleons, like any other chameleon, has a wide range of colors that you're going to experience. And one thing I'd like to show you before I let Jurgen take it is look at the horns. Just look at those horns on the Johnson's chameleon. They have this mottled, even a kind of little tiger stripe leopard spot pattern on the horns. And this is one of their, one of their amazing features. So, all right, let's go ahead and start in. And Jurgen, Give us a yeah. high-level overview of this species. What do you like to know, Bill? <laughs> Just <laughs> ask. Just a it's... high level of well, you know what? Um, yeah, let's let's start off with uh, the the basic uh, forms that we see. I know they come from a number of areas, but yes. uh, what are the ones that we? Uh, let's talk about what's the difference between Rowan Zori and Bwindi. Well, actually, these two species are the ones that are sometimes available. Last year, uh, they didn't come in a lot, even a few years, nothing. Uh, but now things are a little bit changing, and we have high hopes that, uh, yeah, especially Rivenzoris will come in again. 
the biggest difference between Ruwenzori and uh, the other ones, actually, the blue eyes, the Bwindis, is actually that Ruwenzoris have more reddish eyes, face, actually, and the uh, uh, Bwindi subspecies have the more blue eyes and with more blue, yeah, patches uh, around the face and also in the body. So there's actually a color difference between the subspecies from Bwindi area and the Ruwenzori mountains. That's actually the biggest difference, yeah. Now, what do we know of the form that is in Burundi and uh, Rwanda? Well, those species, I had luck to work with the Burundi subspecies, but that's almost like a decade ago, so 10, 12 years ago. Burundi was fully open and um, yeah, hundreds of animals came in in those days. I don't know in the States, I'm talking about Europe. Uh, they were extremely cheap and yeah, not many people were into really keep and breeding them because they were like, okay, they come in so much. Why should we do a lot of effort to breed them and very cheap? But then after two or three years, the imports stopped and they never came in again. So, okay, they were very different uh, from these two uh, subspecies, uh, totally different coloration. I don't know if you have a picture from that Burundi um, subspecies. I don't. I don't. Oh, okay, okay, no problem. They didn't have those exactly bright coloration. They had more soft uh, coloring, more stripes. So totally not nothing to do with these two. Also very nice, um, but like I said, it's quite difficult to explain without showing a picture. Uh, but okay, these animals are not available for like more than 10 years. So the care yeah. was identical as these, I bred them also. But sadly, yeah, import stops, uh, not many people were breeding them again. And of course, like many chameleon species after two, three years, they completely yeah, disappeared actually, which is very sad. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, let's do a little uh, natural history and mm -hmm. let's talk about where they come from. Well, the species we mainly talk about, let's say the Ruwenzori form, the reddish one, actually comes apart in Uganda and uh, the Ruwenzori mountains. And it runs actually over the Congo border into Congo. So actually at that line, yeah, it's, it's, it crosses actually Uganda to Congo, but it's actually more or less the same species that runs over the border. And they live, yeah, it's a mountain species. It's around, yeah, I think 1800 meters high. So yeah, very tropical environment, rainforest. Um, uh, yeah, a cool down at night. Of course, at that height in the night, it cools off a lot. They have the typical morning um, mist. So the fog that really runs in every morning, every night. So even at the drier seasons, they still have plenty of water in the form of mist, fog to drink every morning off. So even, and of course the rain season is almost constantly rain. So it's a very, yeah, what can I say, humid environment. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And for people that are interested in their environment, they actually, this is easy for us because they come from the, uh, the Buwindi form comes from the Buwindi impenetrable forest, which is where Correct. the Ugandan mountain gorillas live. And there yeah. is so much uh, documentaries out there on those mountain gorillas. You can go there and you can see those documentaries and you'll see where the Johnson Eye come from and get a feel for the area. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's true. I even saw a few years ago, there was actually a documentary about the mountain gorillas. And just next to a gorilla, you saw a, a chameleon, a Johnston eye. So, oh, really? Yeah, yeah it's, uh, I saw it one time. I was like, oh, okay, that's a Johnston eye. <laughs> I keep the go. people in my So they really share that environment, actually. Yeah, which is actually good for the species because those parks are quite well protected because of the mountain gorillas. And so actually the chameleons also benefit the, the protection of those areas. So those are quite good, reserved and protected. So it's it's good for the chameleons too. Yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. their uh, their environmental status uh, is least concern. Uh, yeah, they're really. I know from uh, persons. Yeah, 
in Congo and in Uganda that in the prime forests they are very bounded. You know, uh, if okay. they go with a certain group to search them, in one or two nights they can easily spot two, three hundred chameleons in one one night. So, okay. yeah, okay, they are not rare in in prime good quality forests. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, let's go ahead and start talking about what they need if we're going to be setting up a cage and uh basically it's like any other standard chameleon uh where you have your basking area up top and your hiding area uh in the middle they they need to be able to hide behind all that foliage uh but you're gonna what can you tell us about uh, how active they are how big of a cage they need um i would go around about the same size as yeah, care, whatever, like um, Jackson eyes, Xanthelophus. So I would give it a, I will give them, they're quite active. I mean, okay, they have certain moments that they are sitting. They love a lot of plants. So the more, the better. It's not really yeah. important which kind of plants, but they like a really dense planted uh, terrarium where they can hide. And they, they are quite active in the morning because of the cool down, they need to warm up. So they definitely need little basking spots any uv one um but once yeah they, well, once uh, they are warmed up they're really active they search for foods they, they, they really go through the terrarium so yeah it, it needs to be a decent height length depth and like i said the more plants the better that's really mm -hmm. important and if you have the possibility to house them outside uh, we can do it three, four months in Europe, depending on the temperatures and the sun, of course. Uh, outside, they do really great, Bill. They love natural yeah. sun. Shedding goes better. They, they, they enjoy it. You can try to replicate it, of course, with, with lamps, uh, sprinkling installations inside, which is good. But nothing beats, yeah, natural sun, yeah. the outside conditions. They absolutely love it. Yes. Mm hmm all right thank you and just a note for those of you on our uh, the new care summaries i'm including a qr code so uh, this is for the people that want to print out these care sheets and take them to uh, shows and such so each of these has a qr code on the front uh, and so anybody picks this up can just uh, point at it with their cell phone and this uh, scan this and it'll take you directly to the johnson's chameleon profile on the chameleon academy uh, that's a new feature of the care summaries let's go ahead and we're going to be uh, diving into some of the parameters of the johnson's so first of all temperature and humidity let's talk about that jürgen uh they like it humid definitely um so at night if you have the chance to use a fogging installation i would say do it they benefit from it, they drink from it, um, they like it, but of course, not constantly wet. Uh, mostly, I spray in the morning. It's a well-ventilated cage, a screen cage. I prefer screen, you know, that's my experience. Uh, and then in the late afternoon, I also spray. So in the daytime, it's necessarily dries up because constant humidity can give the, um, yeah problems with the feet, fungus. Okay, not constantly wet, but definitely in the morning, a good shower, and then the late afternoon. And I also combine it with a dripper. So actually they can drink from the water uh, on the leaves, but also the constant dripping from the dripping installation, actually. They drink quite a lot. So humidity is very important for, the, for this species. Definitely, yes. Yeah, and I'd like to say, if you look at those humidity numbers that I've got in the care summary, they're pretty high. I mean, what I have from the daytime, 60 to 80 percent, and the nighttime, 80 to 100 percent, that's mm -hmm. keeping a pretty high humidity. And I want to say this, I, I struggled with what humidity number to put on this care sheet. And the thing is, when you put a number down, uh, what I've got to do is I've got to make it safe. So I know that they'd be OK in this range it is very possible that they don't need to be that humid during the day. And the problem exactly. is that uh, I haven't established uh, how, how low we can go yet, so I have to be safe. Uh, so mm -hmm. I want everybody 
to look at these numbers and realize this is just a starting point. And these numbers will change as we get more and more information. And that's one thing about the Community Academy is I change it every year or two to reflect the new information. So when you're looking at this and you're saying, oh my goodness, that's that's so high. Yeah, it is. But remember, it's it's in a safe range. One thing that's important is those uh, those caveats there, those numbers there. You got to ensure that the branches and the surfaces all dry out because then if if they don't, you're going to get foot sores, you're going to get fungus, bacteria. So you have to approach this intelligently, especially with a chameleon like this, where we're we're establishing the parameters. I mean, Johnson's chameleon has been kept and bred in captivity for decades. Uh, I did it in the early 2000s and I reproduced them. Great. But back then I wasn't paying attention to the humidity. I was, uh, it was temperature back then. And then we got an awareness of UVB and now we're getting an awareness of humidity, which is why if you go back to the old information, you get very little specifics is because we really weren't concentrating on it. We're concentrating on it now. And so we're going to get more information, but just, you're just going to hang, have to hang tight because we're learning every day here. Okay. Okay. UVB, Jurgen. What about these mm -hmm. guys in UVB? Uh, well, because of the height, in, they live in nature. They are used to pretty high levels, Bill. Uh, what I noticed, if I put them outside in the summer months, um, I always make sure the morning sun always falls into the, 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 the cage size. And more in the afternoon, when the sun turns, they have more the shadow size. That gives uh, actually the opportunity to warm up in, uh, in the morning and doesn't make it too hot in the afternoon. So if you put your cages outside, it's always the best to give them yeah, the morning sun until 1, 2 p.m. And personally, after that, uh, yeah, I always give a lot of plants anyway in, in the cage, but I always give them benefit from the morning until 1, 1 2 p.m., full sun, and then it turns. But like I said, they bask like one, two hours to warm up, and then they prefer actually to go into the foliage, into uh, the plants. That's more or less my experience with them, yes. Okay. And when having to put together some numbers for a care summary, I had to select something. And they come from the same elevation as the Xanthalophus and yeah. just below the Veiled Chameleon. And so uh, it is a safe bet that they could use the same UVB requirements. And yes. since we've shown that the UV index of three works for everything from a panther chameleon that comes from a elevation of zero sea level, all the way up to the veiled chameleon, which is even higher than the Xanthalophus, I think it's what, 2000, uh, 1500, 2000 meters, something like that. So if the UV index uh, of three works across that wide range, it's a very good, uh, chance that it's going to work well with the Johnson's chameleon that has the same kind of habits. Uh, I would, uh, I would say something like a Triosaurus cristatus, the crested chameleon. That's different because they like to be deep into the foliage. For something like the Marimontanus that comes up from way high up on Mount Maru, or Hanengensis, these are species that come up for uh, from way high altitudes. Those I would think are different UV index. Namakuensis that comes from the desert. Okay, another big question mark. And so this is when I'm having to put down numbers for a care summary. These are the kind of struggles I have to, uh, uh, the challenges and the balances I have to make. So uh, this is uh, likely, uh, it, it, I, I feel very good about these numbers for the Johnson's chameleon. Yeah. Mm hmm. All right. Uh, on the uh, care summary, you're going to be seeing uh, the standard uh, 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 light and hydration cycle that I use for all of the chameleons. I want to say this is only a starting point. It's going to be different for 
uh, with respect to your environment. If you live in a very dry environment, you're going to have to fog, humidify, mist more often. If you come from a wet environment, a down south during uh, when it's very humid, you're not going to have to do as much. So please look at this only as a starting point and then adjust for your particular situation. And uh, Jurgen, you were kind enough to already talk about how you do it. So we, <laughs> okay. So we can go on to feeding. And by the way, just as a note, this little guy up here eating a snail, that one, uh, I took that picture in 2014. That was uh, a Justin I owned by Craig Durbin. Anyway, Jurgen, let's talk about uh, feeding uh, Justin's yeah. chameleons. Well, they are really not difficult, Bill. They try to eat or catch everything which fits into their mouth. Uh, crickets, grasshoppers, snails, like you just mentioned, locusts, cockroaches, silkworms, as good as everything. I think for all the chameleons, what is very uh, important is variation. You know, try to give as different as possible. Before you feed um, the, the feeders actually, also good lodum goods with uh, fruit, vegetables, bee pollen, as much variation as you can. They're really not difficult. They, they eat whatever they can catch. <clears throat> uh, important is to not overfeed them because you have to be aware in nature, they really have to hunt like hours to catch an insect. Of course, in a tiny cage, if you throw in 20 crickets, it's a quite easy meal, you know, they eat like crazy. And then, of course, you need to be sure that they don't get too big, too overweight. So try to find a good balance, Bill, uh, of a healthy chameleon, well fed, but not too big, too fat. So mm -hmm. keep an eye on that. That's the, the, that's Those are the things I always remember for Johnston Ice. Feeding, very important, but don't overfeed them. That's, yeah, that's important. All right, let's talk about supplementation. Very important for these guys. Um, they're quite sensitive to edema. I don't know if people are aware with edema. It are actually uh, like, yes. well. <laughs> but let's, let's um, explain it, but yes, we're very aware. Yeah, yeah, around the neck, the chin, they get blown up. It's like a bulb of air, actually. And it's, yeah, it mostly comes if you overdose with multivitamins, especially vitamin A. So they need it a little bit. I mainly give them a mixture of calcium magnesium. That's always safe to give. Then I try to give them um, Rapagi with vitamin A, but let's say once every 10, 14 days. Also the babies, if you see a little signs of edema, it starts slowly, immediately cut back the multivitamins, a few weeks, nothing, just calcium, and then it goes away. So there are, yeah, that's something very important, Bill. Keep an eye on that. Don't overdose. They need it a little bit, but too much. They not die from edema, but yeah. In yeah. nature, you yeah. never see an animal with edema. So it's something that is overdosed in captivity. So yeah, you need to find a good balance between giving enough, but not too much. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so just a background for the people who are new to the, the edema, this is a imbalance within the body that causes fluid to build up. And usually you see it around the neck. So you get this, like this swollen collar around the chameleon. You can see pictures of that on the Chameleon Academy. Johnson's chameleons are extra sensitive, it seems, to supplementation. And uh, of course, our supplements are not specifically uh, formulated for chameleons. They're just a general supplementation uh, with the best information we have on nutrition. And really, they're doing it for all reptiles. And so the formula is just everything thrown in there. That everything, uh, uh, that balance that they put in there affects chameleons, reptiles differently and different species differently. And it hits Johnson and I. There's something about that balance that just isn't right for Johnson and I. And so it's very easy for them to all of a sudden start getting a swollen uh, neck with the edema. So uh, on this care summary, I have a multivitamin of less than 10,000 uh, 
IUs of uh, D3 per pound, and that's 100,000 IUs of uh, vitamin A per pound. And these are the, the, uh, the Rapashi Calcium Plus Low D, uh, the Reptivite with D3, and the, uh, the Arcadia um, um, uh, Revitalized D. Uh, those are the uh, supplements that have uh, less than uh, the lower levels of D3 and vitamin A. So that's, that's just something to really keep in mind with Johnston's Chameleons. Exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. All right. Let's talk a little bit about breeding. And we are going to talk about, Jurgen, what are your experiences with breeding Johnston I? Well, I had experience with grabbed females coming in from imports. Uh, I had the experience of really breeding them from baby to adults, get them copulated, gravity, laying eggs, incubate eggs. So yeah, I think what you wrote into the care sheets is, yeah, correct. Um, what can I say? Females, the younger females lay around eight, nine eggs for the first clutches. If you have really bigger females, they can go to 14, 16, mm, around that. So eggs are, the eggs are really big, around the size of Mallory. So really, and also the babies when they hatch, they're huge, Bill. They're really strong, yeah. big. And really interesting is um, their gestation period is around three to four months, about exactly the same as the incubation, depending on temperatures, of course. So it's a bit like Duramensis. So relative long, gestation time and a relative short incubation time so uh very important is to not incubate the eggs too warm you have to see the area where they come from mountain species cool down so um yeah of course we work in europe with celsius i can give some numbers in celsius to give an idea uh, i always took in daytime around room temperature let's say 21 22 celsius and then at night, I brought them around 80 Celsius, of course. So, but to, but to be honest, Bill, I never used incubators for that. I put them mostly in my living room. I put a thermometer at a certain place. Or when it, when it became a little bit too warm, I put them in my basement. And mostly the incubation was around three months, three and a half, because I was incubating at the lower sides of temperatures. Mm -hmm. But my experience are the babies were very yeah strong and very important the gender balance was around 50 50 males females i incubated them also warmer but then the babies hatched it before three months but yeah they were weak mm, and also the gender balance was like really crazy almost all okay. males or females i can't really remember so i really advise to, to give them a cool moderate um incubation in moist vermiculites uh, and then normally when you incubate quite well it's around three months and like i said they hatch really big so and if you have a trained eye you can already see out of the egg male female the males mm -hmm. have two dots uh, on their front head and the nose it's sort of like tiny little steps actually but okay i see it but you need to yeah have a good eyesight but it's easy to see male female Definitely in the upcoming weeks, you can easily see how many males and females you have in a clutch. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah. When I was uh, breeding the Johnson and I, I would have them uh, below 70 for my incubation. Uh, I haven't mm -hmm. experimented with above it, so uh, I can't give that from experience. But uh, the below the 70s, they were they hatched out large and beautiful does uh, just uh, it this this species is a joy to breed and really uh, one thing well, i'm going to say is uh, what was that yeah what i can say just like you mentioned um if you incubate cool they hatch out really big strong i hardly lost any babies you know they are really strong not really that difficult you know if they hatch in a in a, uh, in a good size good temperature Perfect. Uh, you really don't have any problems raising them. That's my experience. Definitely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they were a joy to breed. And this is one reason why I'm excited about this species 
And the reason why we're doing this presentation is because if the we have a crack in the importation and they do come in, I want the serious breeders to be ready because this, this is a very good species for uh, your breeding projects and to establish in captivity. They're, when they're captive hatched, they're, uh, they're large, they're, uh, they're hardy, and the, the females have low clutch count. And so it's very easy to raise the babies individually because you're only dealing with 12 or so babies. And so this is a, a great candidate for establishing in captivity. And you'll find with the Chameleon Academy this year, uh, besides the, the, the big three species, uh, Panther Jacksons and Bailds, I'm going to be focusing in on the Johnson's Chameleon, uh, first of all, Campani, the Jeweled Chameleon, and the Carpet <coughs> Chameleon, because those three, I believe, are, uh, are very, uh, are, are great candidates for, for people wanting to get involved with chameleons. Uh, let's see. We're going to go on to the laying bin. What's it like when the, the female decides to lay? Well, it's a bit the typical behavior of searching for a good place. You know, the females go to the ground for several days. They sometimes they stop eating, sometimes not. You cannot really count on that. But you see it clearly, Bill. They go to the ground, they start, they, they start digging places. And in most of the cases, well, around 80, 90 percent, if you put a little plant in the laying bin, they're always going to dig on the, around the roots of the plants. Because it's actually, even in drier times, the roots of a plant always take humidity out of the soil. So if they put the eggs around that area, they are sure that the eggs are always nice, humid. So almost in all the cases, a female would lay her eggs around the plant roots. So just give it a, yeah, a little tank, um, give them the privacy, don't bother them too much, one or two little plants in it. And then, you know, they will dig for one, two, three, two, three days, depending how fast they lay. But if you give them a few plants, normally it's not really difficult and they lay their eggs yeah in a good natural way yeah yeah that's important yeah i always love doing them uh i've done a lot of outdoor keeping and so mm -hmm. uh, I, I will give large areas with various places to choose from uh, and so if you don't have that and you have a cage uh this is a what i'm showing here uh the laying bid is a uh, a simple way to do this where you have a 50 50 sand soil mixture in a bin and just put a plant in it uh, if you want to be sure that you can see where the eggs are you can put a light dusting of uh, sand plain sand on the surface and so you'll see where it's disturbed and if you use the clear bins you can duct tape a hefty bag or any kind of tr uh, trash bag to make sure that they don't come to a clear wall, which they don't know what to do with, uh, and they may stop digging, but so it blocks the light. And then when they're done, you can just take the bag off and you can see where the eggs are. So this is just one, one possibility. They don't need it too deep. I give them four to five inches. And by the way, yes, visual privacy during laying, uh, that is very important. All right. Now, Jürgen, let's talk about what it's like to raise the babies. Um, actually, quite easy. I never had really problems. Like I said, I hardly lost one. I think I raised about around 200, maybe a little over that, babies uh, over the last 20 years. I, I don't think I lost one or two. I put them in a nice green cage. Um, lots of plants, of course. They love it. And in small groups, um, if you have a really nice cage, you can put them just the whole clutch together. Let's say 10, 11 babies, lots of plants. I didn't notice any aggressive uh, aggressivity. They're really calm. They eat good. Um, they don't fight. They don't really stress that much. So, yeah, actually pretty easy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, and I, I found also, them. If it's in the summer, Bill, try also house the babies as much as possible outside 
so they can mm -hmm. benefit the natural sun. I noticed differences in growing of clutches inside and outside. The ones put outside most of the time grow a lot better. So yeah, mm -hmm. okay, that's important. Mm -hmm. So as a uh, standard uh, on the care summary, we like to advise to raise chameleons separately, that they'll do uh, better individually. Uh, when you actually talk to breeders, there's a lot wide range of ways that they they raise babies up. So you are going to hear different ways. But on the care sheet, I need to do the ideal situation. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, yeah, you want to be safe? Follow the ideal situation. Mm -hmm. Okay. Let's see. All right. Uh, at the end of the care sheets, I just want to say one thing about uh, a couple of things about using these care summaries. Uh, and first of all, all of these care summaries and care sheets are just a starting point. Uh, that means this is uh, this gives you an idea of what to set up at the beginning. After that, you listen to your chameleon. You've got to take into account your uh, environmental conditions and what your chameleon's behavior is. Every chameleon is an individual. If they need it warmer, then they're giving you signs that, they, that they're cold. You give it to them warmer. Uh, if they want it cooler, give it to them cooler. So don't the, the care sheet is just a starting point. It's not a jail that locks you in to those particular uh, parameters. Second of all is uh, if you need further re research opportunities, you want to learn more than the care sheet, click those links. Those will take you to the Chameleon Academy, which has a lot more information, a lot more than I can put just on a care summary. It's, it's uh, over 100 pay, uh, web, uh, pages on that website. Uh, and for breeders, influencers, groups, anybody who wants to use these care summaries, you are welcome to use these care summaries. Just use them unaltered. And, uh, you know, I've had people just copy the information and put it on their website. And that's fine. This, this information is for the public. You can use it however you want to. But as you know, with the Chameleon Academy, I, uh, I update it on a yearly or every year or two. So your information, if you just copy the information, it'll actually be old because we keep, I keep pushing forward. I keep having people like Jurgen on and just picking his brain and figuring out what is the latest that we know. And I combine it with people from around the world. So the Chameleon Academy is dynamic and always changes. It will frustrate some people, but it, it's going to be, if you're really wanting the best in husbandry, you know, this is the place to be because we don't know everything yet. And finally, you're going to hear a lot of conflicting husbandry advice out there. And that is because we have so many different experiences. People are in different situations with different chameleons and with different experiences. And you'll see a lot of, uh, no, it's got to be this way. Ah, it's got to be this way. Each one of those ways has a kernel of truth and everybody is just arguing about the middle. It gets confusing. What I would suggest to you, if you have uh, find, uh, conflicting husbandry advice, is pick who you're going to listen to. If it's me, great. Then don't worry about what other people say. If it's your breeder, which is whoever is hand-holding you and is there and you are consulting with on a daily basis, that's who I say to listen to. Even if they don't agree with me, Listen to that person because that's the one who's helping you. Once you get your feet under you and your understanding under you, then you can explore all the different opinions and figure out which one you like. So expect that there will be conflicting husbandry advice out there. Your way to deal with that is pick your the person you're going to listen to and listen to that person until you feel comfortable enough to uh, to uh, listen uh, to explore other oper uh, other uh, approaches and it's now question and answer time so if anybody has a question for jurgen or me about uh, the johnson's chameleon uh please put them in the chat and uh let, let's ask some questions uh, let's see I'll, I'll do, do. uh people are let's see people are having problems Questionable use of wild cock chameleons from, okay. 
<sighs> Julie, we have one from Julie Hubbard saying, what do you think of the legal but questionable use of wild-caught chameleons from Madagascar? Okay, using wild-caught chameleons is a, uh, is a murky issue. And uh, we, we discuss this a lot. In fact, uh, on the podcast, I would encourage you to go to the podcast where I have uh, the Chameleon Academy podcast with Dr. Chris Anderson. We talk about conservation. Uh, the people who love chameleons are also involved in conservation. And the, uh, the, the parameters surrounding that are uh, complicated. If the, the, there is the natural, the people who live in the area that the chameleons come from, and how does this affect them? Uh, so uh, instead of taking this episode to talk about this, please consult that the, the last, uh, let's see, two weeks ago on the Chameleon Academy podcast, we I did an entire episode with Dr. Chris Anderson about conservation. We talk about this particular topic. Um, Jurgen, we have a a question about what is the captive lifespan? Well, um, I think it's pretty long, Bill. I can remember um, I had some wild cuts in, let's say, several years ago. And he was not even, f I, I buy the mail, and he was like not really adult, but still young. So I guess he was like 15 months old. And I kept him finally for six years. So counting back, he must be around seven, seven and a half. That was okay. the longest I kept a male. Of course, females, if they lay quite intensively with uh, the good food, vitamins, the clutches are always big. I think females don't live six, seven. That's extreme. But I think in if you keep them in prime quality uh, without um yeah what can i say parasites so with all the good conditions you mentioned in your care sheet i think around seven years must be really and maybe more must be possible bill definitely yeah yeah i'm gonna i'm gonna guess this is a 10-year potential here they uh they're about yeah. that size <laughs> so i'd say that let's see here is <laughs> uh Asking, uh, do they reproduce via live birth like Jackson's? No, no. <laughs> <laughs> we will nope, be nope. just. <laughs> That's why we talk about eggs and such. Uh, this, this is a. Th there is often a confusion between Johnson's chameleon and Jackson's chameleon, and those uh -huh. of us deep into the chameleon world, uh, there's absolutely no way you could uh, confuse either of them. <laughs> we see all the differences, but to someone who's uh, just being introduced to this species, a three-horned chameleon is a Jackson's chameleon. So yes, the uh, the major change uh, differences, the major difference is that the Jackson's chameleon is live bearing, Johnson's chameleon is egg laying. And uh, Juan Gonzalez was a good size cage for one of these chameleons. Uh, that was we, we, two by two by four foot is standard and that's sufficient, but Bigger is better. Mm -hmm. um, so, all right. Well, let's go into, Jurgen. what is the availability and what, what is the trade status of the countries where they come from? Well, I was about to tell you about that, uh, Bill. I think it's really interesting if people you know especially at these times that imports coming in very difficult quotas are difficultly given many countries are closing uganda do bans uh many countries mozambique no quota um yeah tanzania already closed for three years i guess i think it's a really rewarding species to do the efforts of keeping them breeding them they're so beautiful bill male and female they are, if you give them the good conditions, you can breed them over several generations. Uh, and we don't know, will they ever come in again? I mean, it can be done in a, in, a, in, a, in a clip that you cannot find them anymore. So I think if you have the opportunity to get animals, even wild cuts, okay, 
um, wild cards, you need to treat them maybe for parasites. Okay, uh, give them the right care, a lot of water. You need to keep an extra eye on them. But it's such a beautiful species. Once established and really relaxed in captivity, they are beautifully, they are hardy, they are good to breed, not really difficult to incubate. The raising of the babies is not that hard. And like I said, they are like perfect. I mean, the males have the three horns, a medium-sized chameleon, all the colors you can imagine, and also the females have those beautiful colorations. So, yeah, it would be a shame, Bill, to lose that species. It really would be. Yeah, I, I'm really, because they didn't come in now for like three, four years, and we hope, we worked with a few people, that something beautiful would happen in the near future. But let's wait and see. Uh, but definitely, uh, yeah, it's worth going for this species. I mean, it's one in, in my top four or five of the most beautiful triocera species together with Deramensis, Quadricornis, and maybe, yeah, let's say Jackson Eye. But these are like jewels, Bill. It's like, yeah, please, people, if you love chameleons with so many, yeah, good qualities and beauty, yeah, please don't the, 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 don't make them lose them. Okay, that's important. They are they are amazing, Bill. Really. But what what has changed that we're now we hear every now and then we start hearing about Johnston Eye. Why why are we hearing about that now? Well, Uganda was more or less closed for the last three years, and yeah, I need to be a little bit careful about my sources. But I heard it would be only captive breads. There are no officially quotas okay. released, but okay, that's my source. Okay, I will not go further than that. Um, so actually the biggest export country was, uh, because Burundi was closed almost 10 years ago, then Uganda closed three years ago. But now, yeah, we have yeah some friends, importers of me, get some good, good contacts in Congo. The, yeah, in the beginning years, Congo was like, ah, don't do it. The, the, the airports are so far from the finding places. If they arrive, they're going to come terribly in. But okay, uh, I know I have more or less good contacts that some sources, they're working very hard on it to do it in a really fast, professional way. So yeah, I think with a little bit of luck, Bill, I think something bright will happen. Let's wait and see. <laughs> All right. So, yeah, as per usual, when things are coming out of Africa, you never know. So yep. really what this episode here is, is just to prepare us. As yep. we know, things happen. And there may not be any warning of things happening. And all of a sudden, boom, you have an opportunity. And it's a one-time, one-shot deal. I know. Exactly. I mean, things coming out of Congo, the area where the Johnson and I come from are a literally over two day, is it a two day trip if they want to drive it all the way to the airport. So it's not easy to, if you're going to do, uh, send anything out of the Congo. Uh, so uh, it's not like if it happens once, it's going to happen again and again and again. So exactly. the only thing we can do here in the community is be prepared. And mm -hmm. if it happens, we we know that it's a special occurrence and uh, we, we shouldn't let it just slip through our fingers like uh, things have happened so many times in the past. Uh, I think actually, Bill, if it should come now and you have access to, you know, for imports, quite good animals, good health, I think that's really an, opportun an opportunity you cannot miss. I mean, with all the benefits, the beautiful uh things they have the 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 the, the, the good care possibility the breeding possibility and like you said now with congo get export quotas will they be able to do it next year will there be a total ban i think you know if you have your chance yeah and and of course the time the money the place whatever it's yeah, really yeah, yeah definitely mm -hmm. yeah and th this isn't meant to just rile everybody up and say, I ah, have everybody want Johnson and I. This message is to, for the serious breeders who say, okay, I want to work with this animal. If you see Johnson and I come in, this isn't, I, I would encourage this to go to breeders and not to people who just want a pet. Um, because if they go to the breeders, then you will be able to get these as pets. And if they go to the breeders, 
then we'll be able to get them as pets for years and years to come. Uh, if they're just dispersed into the into the world, uh, like I, I I don't know how they're going to come. Uh, if they are and they're dispersed, then they'll disappear. So this is a this is an opportunity for the community to you know, we've done we've done a lot of big talking and uh, grousing about oh we we really wish we had more cotacornas we really wish we had this species well you know like montium almost essentially gone mm -hmm. those came in and they were literally coming in at thirty five dollars each exactly and they were everybody ignored them well yeah. You know, I hope we've learned our lessons and uh, we, we can see if we get this opportunity, a select group of serious breeders, I'm hoping mm -hmm. will come together and make the most of it. Um, so, all right, uh, Jurgen, we're coming on to the end of our hour. Is there anything nope. else we should talk about as far as uh, Joss and I? Well, just like I said, one of the most beautiful species, Triocerus, you can imagine. Uh, you have beauty, you have the horns, you can keep them good. I'm not going to say, just like you said, I really, I don't want to give them to the starter. Let's, yeah, you need to have a certain level of experience. Uh, I'm not going to say they're really difficult, but let's say it's always, um, yeah, good that you, let's say, you bred some Jackson, some Hunelli, some mountain species. And if you have some good experience in those ones, okay, you can go that step further up to the Johnston Ice. So, but like I said, uh, the beauty of them, male and female, the horns, the medium size, you don't need a cage like a Parson Eye. You can keep them in a medium cage, uh, really easy. And like I said, once established, and especially uh, because we talk a lot about wildcats, but if you work with uh, captive breads, yeah, it's a pleasure, Bill. They don't have the stress. They, 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 you know the age, you, they, they come to you, they, they, they eat a, an insect out of your fingers, they are like such a, such a joy to keep and, and it's really, yeah, I really gonna go again for them, <laughs> definitely, yes. it, it, it's a beauty, it's a beauty, definitely. Yeah. And, and to the people listening to this, really, please take this to heart, if you're just looking for a good community experience, wait until the breeders provide captive hatched individuals you will exactly. have an incredible experience if you get a wild caught it's not going to be as nice that's for experienced people who know how to deal with wild mm -hmm. cots and don't want to interact with them give them a cage on their own so they're they're happy they live their life happy taken care of not interacting and uh, let, let let the breeders do that you get the captive hatched ones from the breeders and you're going to have an incredible experience. Uh, now, one thing I will say that's wonderful about this species is that the females are incredible as well. And I'm frustrated that it's so hard to find pictures that really bring out the patterns that you see in the females. Uh, but when you see them in real life, it's it's beautiful. And so even though they don't have the the horns like the males, uh, the females are just as a pleasure to have as the males. And so uh, I, I'm, I'd be excited to have either one. So. Okay. Uh, so, Jurgen, I want to thank you so much for coming on and sharing <laughs> your experiences. And I am hoping uh, that something happens for the community. Uh, we have a lot of, we have, a lot to work on and a lot to work with and uh this this would be a great thing to add so i will say I, goodbye I, I also want to say big thanks for this interview and i also want to say a uh, big thanks to you bill to put all your care your effort into those care sheets they are beautiful oh, yeah. they are correct they are informative i mean you you need to deserve some credits to put all the work that you put in it Really, man. Well, thank you very much. <laughs> really great. All right. Uh, All right, everybody. We'll see you. We're here every Saturday morning. Next Saturday, we're going to be doing this again with Michael Nash talking about Fursifer Campani, which he has going to start to be able to have captive hatched Campani available. And so uh, just come back every Saturday morning. You're going to be getting uh, more and more information about this wonderful chameleon world of ours. So. 
We'll see ya. Bye bye.